Welcome to the Startup Grind. Tonight, uh, we are hosting Nancy Sumari. And she's an awesome person. You know, a lot of times we, you meet beauty queens and you're like, oh, maybe they're going to be stuck up. Maybe they're going to be like this. But she's such a humble person and she's so much fun and she's so nice and she's really inspiring and she's quite an avid entrepreneur actually. So I hope you enjoy her journey um, and you learn a lot from it. So we're going to start and I'll just welcome Nancy. Thank you. Shall I sit? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead and sit. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm very excited to host her, as you can see, I'm like, <laughs> all smiles. Um, so Nancy Karibu. Thank you. Yes. So uh, maybe we start from the beginning, about your life growing up. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? How was life like growing up? Um, so I just want to thank um, Cindy and the whole Startup Grind team for hosting me this evening. It's quite, um, I'm very humbled and it's such a huge um, honor for me to be here. So. I was born in a town called Merirani. I don't know if, um, I'm sure most of us have heard about it before. It's um, at the heart of Tanzanite mining. So my dad has a farm there. My dad is a farmer slash geologist um, who sort of made us grow around um, animals and farms and it was quite fun. We had such a fun childhood. Um, both of them were entrepreneurs, so a lot of times they had to work very hard they weren't around home a lot, but um, my siblings and I sort of, I quite remember us really enjoying ourselves out there. And then eventually, um, because both of my parents were very passionate about education, uh, they moved us. So we moved from Merirani and then out to Nairobi because uh, somehow they felt the schools were much better there. So we moved out there, we started an education, set up a life there quite modest, and then went to school back home, so that was pretty much. Okay, what, what school did you go to in Nairobi? Um, so I went to a government school called Blue Belts, and then after that I went to Maasai High School, and then after that I came back. After my high school, I came back to Dar to, to university. Yeah, so, yeah. okay. Um, so you say that your parents were entrepreneurs, but there's something that you told me is that although your parents were entrepreneurs, you never really thought that you'd go into yes. entrepreneurship. Why is that? Um, I suppose possibly it was because I felt that they worked too hard. Um, and I think it was, for me, it just seemed like a more you know, easy option, you know, you go to work, you get paid at the end of the month. It was something that was quite appealing to me at some point, well, for a considerable amount of time growing up. Um, you know, it, I feel like the lifestyle was sold throughout my school life, you know. It was always work hard, um, do well in your exams, get a job, and yeah, so that pretty much kind of yeah. was set um, quite firmly throughout my growing up. But then watching my parents and them being the exception in, in, uh, during that time to be entrepreneurs, it was sort of like a hard wire. It was always meant to be for me to just go out and be an entrepreneur myself. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we can't host you and not talk about your beauty queen days. So we just have to talk about that just a little bit. Um, how did you get into the pageant business? And so it was purely by chance. Uh, I always tell a lot of people that I never really found myself to be the beauty queen type. I never really felt like, um, you know, the whole industry was, was for me. It was more for my sister, my older sister. She was a lot, you know, like that. Yeah. I was very jean sneakers, uh, rough around the edges type of a, a girl growing up. So, um, like I said, I came back to Dar to, for university. And when I was still processing my applications and so on, a lady just approached me and said, um, I think that this presents an opportunity for you. Uh, I think you would do well. You might win, you might not win, but I think you, know, you don't have much to lose, so I think you should try it out, and I did. Um, and at first I became second, which wasn't so bad, and then I found my face on the paper, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I should add that I didn't tell my parents that this is what I was doing. So um, 
I just participated. It felt like an opportunity. Uh, the prize was uh, to win a ticket to go to South Africa, and at that point in time, I'd never been on a plane, and it sounded like a really good idea. So I proceeded on to do the um, contest, and then my dad just opened the paper one morning and found my face there. So. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about what happened after, but um, yeah, so that everything was history after that. Yeah. So I went on to, to do Miss Tanzania and it worked out pretty well. Yeah. And then yeah, to Miss World and everything else is okay. history. Actually, I was going to ask you, how did your parents take it? Yeah. Um, well, at first they did not warm up to it. They were pretty, um, because you know, when you're done with high school, when you're off to, to the university, um, parents mostly kind of, uh, almost give, take a breather there, that they've done their job well. And then you come around and tell them, look, I'm not going to university anymore. I'm actually going to go out and be a beauty queen. Um, it's not something easy to swallow. I don't think I would take it the same way if it was my own daughter. Yeah. <laughs> but um, they were pretty supportive after. And yeah, everything worked out well, I think. OK. So fast forward to the Miss World competition, uh, right. where you did very well in comparison to the other Miss Tanzania, like how was that for you? It was very exciting, it was, I felt that I was very lucky and blessed during that time. Um, again, I did not think I was going to win or do well in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Uh, I did not think that um, it would work out the way it did, but it eventually went out very well and yeah, I think I was just very lucky and blessed at that yeah. point in time. Yeah. So you just think it was luck and blessing? I do think that, yeah. yes. Were you, did you have to be strategic in any kind of thing? Um, that you, did? you see, the difference was that I'd never, I'd never been um, to that stage of, like I said, beauty was never really an option for me. And then everything was happening so fast at that point in time. One day I was just a regular person. The other day I was Miss Tanzania and then in less than three weeks, I think, after winning Miss Tanzania, I was in China competing at the Miss World competition. Um, so everything was really happening very fast. I think I just decided to um, be in that moment and you know, do what I needed to do to the best of what I could. Yeah. And then everything else you know, worked out the way it did. OK, so how, after the Miss World competition, how was your life? Like, you were, you were 18? You must have been 18. I was 18, yes. At 18, I remember I was dancing on tables yeah. and, you know, getting drunk. Where are you now? <laughs> Maybe we should be interviewing you. <laughs> but I'm trying to, to just see how was it growing up for you under the spotlight with it was, everybody. Like, it was very different. Um, I think I had a great support system for my family, yeah. my parents, my sisters and brothers. Um, I think they helped me quite, uh, quite significantly to just help ground me. Yeah. But it was very different. Um, I had to travel a lot. I met a lot of people. I was, I'm very thankful and blessed for that. And yeah, everything was, it was different, but possibly not so much because um, I had a great support system. Yeah. So how um, did that experience prepare you for, for um, the entrepreneurship journey? Well, entrepreneurship I world? think me meeting a lot of people and seeing, being in a lot of different places away from home a lot of the time and seeing the way things are done, meeting a lot of young people who are doing quite significant things and in things that will had positive impact really resonated with me. Um, I also wanted to be in a space where I could be able to do something that meant s something bigger than uh, and outside of myself. Yeah. And I think that was one of the launch pads for me to see things outside of myself and uh, being more than just for me. Yeah. And I think that that was possibly the most um, positive thing that came out of Miss Tanzania and yeah. the Miss World, Miss World experience. World. Okay, so now you've finished the Miss World competition and um, you had a lot of projects going on that you did. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that, that you know, you did to help the youth, the women and, and stuff um, like that? Well, I think after that I started, the, I started a modeling competition. I was with one of my friends. We, did, we, we decided to give an opportunity for girls to, to find um, agencies or opportunities or platforms for them to find work outside of the Tanzanian market. So we partnered with a South African agency and we scouted for girls around and we found opportunities for five girls at that point in time, which was pretty, pretty un unprecedented. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they're out there still working, which is really good. That's great. Yeah. That, that's awesome. It and is. Do you remember the, any one of the girls that's doing Yeah, um, Amy was one of them. She's, she's now still modeling in South Africa. Okay. Uh, Tony was one of them as well. So they're yeah. still out there okay. doing their thing. That's yeah. awesome. 
Um, yeah. Um, what what other projects? I know you kind you went you did the tour. The yes, I did. Awards. So I, I went into the PR world, and then through that we saw an opportunity to recognize the efforts of women in Tanzania. There wasn't anything like that in the market at that point in time, and so we felt that. And personally, for me, um, my mom was always a big part of my life. She worked very hard. She was, she's a very selfless woman. She raised five kids and running a business. And it was, um, it was quite interesting to watch. And so I felt that there's a lot more of these kind of stories and more mm -hmm. of women doing incredible things in their societies for not just themselves, their families and communities. And I felt um, it was important for for us to have a platform where we recognize them, we show them that they care, and we just pretty much learn best practices from each other as women. Yeah. So yeah, this is how Twa came about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's done pretty well so yeah. far. Yeah, it's doing yeah. pretty well. Um, just maybe your experience of setting up something from scratch from both the modeling competition and Twa. Yeah. And um, yeah, how was it like setting it up, you know, making it run, going to get sponsorships and all that stuff. Well, the challenge with that always is, first of all, will people get it? I think uh, it was, I had an, a, possibly an advantage because I had a wide network base that I had established, but beyond that, it was mostly, yes, you are through the door, that will only get you through the door, but then to sell the idea and for someone to buy into the vision is always quite a big challenge and it still is to date. Um, but I think just being confident, having that conviction, trusting in your, trusting your instinct and your vision is always something really important and holding on to it. Yeah. Um, a lot of times you find that people have great ideas, they have the vision, but you know, once you put, it in, you put it out to the world and then you start getting a lot of ideas and then you lose yourself somehow yeah. in it and then you lose the confidence and the direction as well, yeah. it's, it's not a good thing. But Holding on to the original idea and the vision is quite is something that I've found to be quite important through my, my journey of entrepreneurship and setting things up. So um, the challenge has always been funding. The challenge has always been um, for people to understand it, to take it off the ground, and to, to really scale it up to the to, to the vision that you want it to be. Uh, but yeah, we work hard. We 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 are consistent, mm -hmm. we were aggressive with it and yeah. it works. Do you think it was easier or harder for you because you because you are a beauty queen or you were you were popular, you you know, you're widely known? Was it easier or was it harder for you? Well, um, it really depends how you look at it. Perhaps it was easier for me, but on the on the other hand I would say it's it, it wasn't easy at all because Again, it just that only gets you through the door. That only gets you a meeting. But then to sell the idea is something entirely different. Um, and a lot of times, the misconceptions that come with being a beauty queen and being, you know, in the spotlight yeah. is not always positive. It's you have to prove people wrong a lot of times. Mm. You have to um, convince people that you do actually have substance in that head. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, what's one experience? What's one experience that you kind of had to prove somebody wrong, like? Well, for instance, yeah. even with Twa alone, um, to be able to, well, I, w I think I was 21 or 22 at that point in time, and um, it wasn't easy because someone, first of all, you're an ex-beauty queen, and then, so you're a has-been, <laughs> and then um, you're trying to sell an idea, and then perhaps two days ago you were on, the pay or you were on a tabloid or something yeah. with some story, so... Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's very difficult to be able to convince someone that you're committed, that you are able to do it, that you are consistent yeah. and, and, and so on. So it's not until, often I've had to, I've found myself in a position where I've had to do things even out of my own pocket or just with the resources that I can be able to, to, to put together just to be able to show that this thing works even though I am behind it or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so may, um, also, you've talked about the PR world. Yeah. Um, you have you had a background in marketing by yes. then. Yeah. So how was it kind of moving from a marketing to a PR background, and how was it working in such an environment? Well, I'd never really had any experience in PR before, aside from the fact that perhaps through Miss Tanzania and Miss World, I think I was around a lot of these PR agents, and I kind of 
just learned a lot from them, being around them. I felt it was a market that presented an opportunity for me at that point in time. Um, and so I, I did it for a little bit and then I think, you know, I, I grew it at some point. I just felt I needed to move on to different pastures. But it was, it was a great learning experience as yeah. always. Um, I like to do things, I like to learn, I like to, even though I, I might not possibly make any money out of it or mm -hmm. get any significant work out of it, but I think the experience is always very important for me. Okay, that, that's awesome. Um, so now let's kind of move into Bongo Five. Yeah. yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you do there. So Bongo Five Media Group is based, started out as a, it actually still is a content generating platform. So we started out with our website, uh, which is very popular among young people. And I hope a lot of the people in here know about it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's basically content genera generation. We try and come up with things that we find the young people are re find relevant. Um, it's a team of young people, so we, we try and um, traffic things or put out things that we think uh, young people will find relevant. It's everything mm -hmm. from entertainment, it's everything from sometimes politics, sometimes just, you know, d pure discussions and so mm -hmm. on. So we, we started as a website, we grew into a publication that mirrored the website, which is bi-monthly. And then now we're going into radio um, and hopefully television in the future. Okay. So we hope to become a, a full-on media. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, so Bongo 5 has undergone a lot of changes in, yes. in the past few years. Yeah. Um, and when you came along, you kind of changed it up, restructured. Yeah. And um, maybe you can just take us through the changes that Bongo Well, Five when I joined, it was, it, again, it was just a website. It was, it was just uh, purely online. I felt that we needed to somehow reach out to a lot of um, the people who were not online at that point in time, 2006 and now to look at the changes that we've experienced with the people who are able to access the internet and use it to its potential is quite different. So I felt that at that point, um, being just online kind of um, limited us significantly and I wanted to just broaden our perspective. And again, I felt we just needed to have a bigger dream in terms of being a full-on conglomerate, like you said. Um, so I started slowly to be able to first of all, have a publication that we distribute to five regions at the moment, and then thereafter just grow into radio. Because we had a lot of content, and, I, and a lot of times we had newspapers um, using a lot of our content, or television using a lot of our content, and I felt we could do that as well. We have the content, we, we do the, a lot of the legwork anyway, and we just need, need to expand on the platforms that we currently have. And so we started out as a website, and then when I came in, we. Th threw in the publication and now we just acquired our radio, our, our, our first radio license and we're working on our TV one. So it's been quite a journey and it's not easy, um, especially because online marketing again started out very slow. That, mar that part of the market was very slow for a very long time and so we had to strap our boots quite Quite, quite a lot of the times, but um, it's changing, it's growing, and we've been very uh, blessed to grow as the market grows as well. Yeah, um, you've mentioned something about people using your content. How has like copyright issues, how have you been handling copyright issues with people using your content without your permission or giving you the credit for it? Well, it's, again, it's, it's something that I think um, changes with time because when we first started, there was, it was um, pure anarchy out there. <laughs> it, there were no laws whatsoever, but I think now you know there's, there's a cyber bill that's been put out. I think it will, well, I, I don't know that it says a lot about copyright issues, but um, I think it, it will significantly help us. Uh, initially, it was very hard. We only just used to, you know, place a call and whatnot, but it never really got to the core of the problem. Mm. But now, I think having also our own platforms that we can be able to share our own news and on our own terms will significantly help us. And you know, you you can never really exhaust or cap the amount of people who want to use their co your content yeah, at a content. given time. Yeah. 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 So. Um, so you also switched from English to Swahili and then, yes. yeah, why was that? Um, I think again it was just in a bid to reach more people, to mm -hmm. reach more um, Tanzanians. Initially it was English because it was, 
I think it was just a direction that we started with and now we, we're trying to dabble in both. When I came in, we switched to exclusively Swahili and it helped our traffic significantly and now we feel we are in a space that we can be able to dabble in both ways. So we are shifting to some content that is in English, some co most of the content is still in Swahili, but yeah. we're we are working to stabilize both English and Swahili content. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. I know a lot of uh, media organizations make money from advertisements. Yes. Was it difficult for you um, getting advertisers to advertise with you while your, you know, your content is in English as opposed to when it was in Swahili? Uh, initially, it was, yes, because you see, Target markets are different for every, every other company and whatnot. But I think now um, the landscape is changing significantly. I think also having English and Swahili content gives us an added advantage as well in terms of sponsorship. But overall, it's, it's not easy. It hasn't been easy, um, but we're working. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, there's, um, there's a trend that um, I noticed. I don't know if other people noticed, and it's very, um, it happens a lot in America in the, you know, in the more developing, in developed countries. Yeah. But it's something that you guys did and it kind of broke the internet. It, you know, um, kind of having that exclusive on the Mr. and Mrs. Mengi wedding. Right. How, how did you guys come up with that? How did you think of it? I'm just trying to get into your head. Like, what, what was the plan? And Well, um, so there wasn't specific plan because we we suggested we reached out to them and suggested that so we sold well I basically just sold them this big story of how the pictures were going to come out anyway yeah. and so it was just a matter of time it was uh, we offered them a platform to do it on their own terms um, they were happy with what we were offering at, at that point in time and it worked out we were not sure how it was all going to play out. We had a server crash twice when we did mm. it, but I think overall it worked out pretty well. Yeah. 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 So, what other kind of trends are you looking to, you know, introduce in the media world? Because that's a first I've seen in Tanzania. So, well, if I say them now, they might. <laughs> But I mean, uh, it's always just trying to be strategic and, uh, and being one step ahead of the game, right? Mm -hmm. um, just, again, identifying opportunity faster than anyone would mm -hmm. and um, just offering something that possibly no one else is offering. So that this is what we work for and this is what we work, work towards mm -hmm. possibly on a daily basis. It's just to try and see how we can be one step ahead of the game, thinking outside, way outside of that box that yeah. people say. Yeah. And yeah. Hope that we just finish first. Okay. Um, you also, with Bongo Five, you guys also introduced the Two Zos Award to yes, we did. awards. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that as well. So this is, um, the Two Zos was also, a part, it was an idea that we had had for quite a long time. It just never somehow panned out. Um, the opportunity was just never quite right, the time didn't quite fit. But then eventually, I think um, about two years ago, we just decided that we were gonna do it. So we reached out to a couple of sponsors and partners and they responded quite well to the idea. And um, at first when we did it again, it wasn't that many people who really got it. And we kind of just really stuck to the vision and believed in it and saw the opportunity um, way ahead of everyone else and we decided to just do it. We introduced it in the market. We didn't get that many numbers, we didn't get that many sponsors, but we, we just decided to do it. Um, and you know, once you build it, they'll come. Mm -hmm. So we did it the first time and it was relatively successful, but when we did it a second time around, it was, I think it just blew out of the water. So yeah. it, was, it was very successful. We were very happy with how it turned out. We were very happy with the response. I think people just uh, warmed up to it, to it a lot more a second time around and it, it, it has worked out quite well, I think. Yeah, so how does it work? Because it's like People's Choice Awards. How, yeah. does, how does it work? The whole so system. we present with we present um, a set number of categories. Uh, I think last year we had thirteen. This is certified by the National Arts Council. So we consult them and then they they vet the categories and we set them out to the public yeah. to propose names of the, the the ones that resonate with them the most, the popular ones, the ones that they feel are you know it. Yeah. So they propose in the names and then somehow it's just a game of numbers. It's a mm -hmm. game of who comes out on top with the most number of fans. So we have most popular um, 
categories in media, radio, television, uh, film, actors, actresses, sport, and it's just all a game of numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So did you guys have, you guys received any kind of, you know, backlash because somebody was voted? Um, we did, yeah. yeah, because I think a lot of times people were used to the traditional way that award shows have been run, yeah. where there's a committee that sits down and vets names, but for us we don't have anyone vetting anything. Again, it's purely um, numbers, so you get the numbers, you win, you don't, then you don't win. Yeah. So I think once we have, we, we communicated that over and over again for people to understand that the more you vote is actually, you know, no vote will complain, yeah. I think it, it has sunk in significantly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, what what are the expectations <coughs> for the upcoming Tuzo Zawatu? Uh, the pressure is on. <laughs> needless to say, yeah. we want it to be the premier event in Tan social event in Tanzania. We want it to to grow to be an award show like none other. So, um, being the third time, I think people have gotten it, sponsors have gotten it, and it's now really just time to prove ourselves yeah. uh, to do it eff efficiently, effectively, transparently and yeah hopefully not get any more complaints <laughs> okay um so with the bongo five and tuzo zawatu um how many people do you employ and what's your culture like your working culture organization culture so we have a t uh, we currently have a team of 12 it's all a team of young people um we it's more of like a community uh mm -hmm. we try to be a family, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, we're very open about issues. We, we work together. We understand the vision. I think once it was very easy for us that once each and every one of the team members understood the vision and understood where we wanted to go and also saw themselves v in the vision, I think it was very easy for us to just kind of build that A team and move forward. Mm. I think a lot of times our businesses or employees, and I found myself in this situation as well, a person just doesn't buy into the vision. They don't understand it. They don't see themselves in it. And mm. it's just, it's, it's, it's definitely not, not a ma yeah. match made in heaven. But for us, we've been very lucky to have quite a strong team, a dedicated one. I think it's the hardest working one um, in the industry, and I dare say. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really thankful and proud of them, really. Okay. So yeah. the people, the 12 people, what yeah. do they do? Like, what are their roles? So we have four people who are in content. Yeah. Um, we have an gra in-house graphic designer. We have um, a driver, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. We have uh, an accountant, very important, and yeah. a junior accountant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so you have, <coughs> one of the things that I was surprised is that you have four people handling content, content, content and you yeah. have so much content. How, yeah. do, how do they manage that? Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's mostly that they schedule each other. It's yeah. very scheduled, it's timed, it's, um, again, it's, th they support each other significantly, they help each other out, and um, I'm very strict on the amount of content they put out a day, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. So, no compromise. <laughs> I was just about to ask you, like, how are you as a boss? Like, if you had to describe yourself as a boss, three words. Well, that's difficult to say. <laughs> I wish one of them was here, but um, I think I... I'm very um, understanding, but I also think that I'm, I'm a lot of times very, uh, I'm demanding. Because I, de I, I know the potential that they present and I refuse to accept anything le other than what I believe they, they can offer. Yeah. So, and I think I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have to be understanding, <laughs> awesome, and demanding as a boss, okay. <laughs> but but uh, in all fairness, I think they should also get a chance to, <laughs> to, to say, yeah. <laughs> okay, so enough about Bongo 5. Yeah. Um, I also want to talk about um, your work with the Negesti Sumari Foundation. Right. Yeah. So what kind of pushed you to, work, to start the Negesti Sumari Foundation? Um, after my daughter was born, I, um, I, I, I should say first that I've always been very passionate about books, about reading, about literature and literacy. I think after my daughter was born, I think it was very high on my priority list for us to have as many books around the house as possible, as much content to read. 
uh, from home as possible. Yeah. And when I was out trying to get this, these books for her and the content and whatnot, I realized there was a gap. There's not enough um, local writers and, and our children are not getting enough local content to read, to understand our stories in our own way. So I decided to write a book. Yeah. And um, so we decided to form the foundation and do the book through it so that we can be able to do something bigger aside yeah. from just writing a book and um, yeah, having it out for, for children to read. So we formed the foundation with a special focus on education and literature, but, but we do several things as well under, under it. Um, my partner in the foundation is very passionate about technology, so he takes that up significantly and yeah. does a lot of work around that. Um, I mostly focus on the education part. We distribute a lot of books to public schools, okay. and um, I do a literature club at the Oyster Bay Primary School, yeah. two weeks out of a month. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, it's very, it's it's quite um, powerful and empowering to be around these children reading and just seeing what these books and the stories that come out of these books mean to them, yeah. and see how this, the, these these stories that they listen to or read change their lives. So I think um, the foundation work is probably the most important work that we are doing at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you also, one of the things that I saw, you also do uh, to empower youth and women. Yeah. Is there anything that you've done so far that to, is towards empowering youth and women? So I just, I have two mentors. So I, I mentor to, <laughs> I mentor to um, young, young women. Uh, at the moment, so that's the work that I've started doing aside from the literature club, lit clubs that I run at Oyster Bay Primary School and distributing the books. But I intend to do much more. Um, the challenge that I face currently is just the time to be able to fit in um, all of the work that I'm doing with Bongo 5 or the foundation or outside of that, fit in, fitting it all in, but um, we're we'll, we'll working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, there's also there's a hub, the DA hub that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a part of the Global Shapers community. Yeah, Global, Shapers, um, yeah. Global Shapers are a group of young people who are committed to improve the state of, of the Dar es Salaam community. Uh, we've done quite a number of, the, the Global Shapers is under the World Economic Forum. I don't know if, yeah. if you've heard about it. Um, so basically that we, we just come together and try and make impact through activities or through our own activities and joint activities within the hub. Uh, we've done uh, behavioral change activities around HIV and destigmatizing HIV altogether around youth. And we're now running um, a project to, inc we, we run rather, a project to encourage young people to register to vote and several other things that are coming up. So that's. Um, <coughs> Yeah. The I am positive. I am positive yeah. Yes. How how did that run? Like, did people understand the campaign? Uh, so at first it wasn't it wasn't as easy as we had thought it would have been. Mm. The idea was for everyone to come out and destigmatize HIV or, and really just open up that conversation around young people and see what young people were thinking, you know, how they were responding to it and so on. So the tagline, really, I am positive, is what c c carried it all. We were supposed to put out pictures of ourselves and saying why we were positive. Yeah. So um, I got a, personally got a lot of phone calls asking me what had happened and yeah. why are you positive? Why are you saying you're positive? <laughs> and if you are really positive, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But um, I think it did a good job in sort of really destigmatizing HIV and AIDS, um, opening up that conversation and looking at it differently, looking at it outside of really the negativity that it carries yeah, it and carries. presented an opportunity for young people to just um, be above it, I think, yeah. which, which, which I think was really good. Okay. Yeah. Um, and how is it now doing the voters registration, you know, encouraging young people to go and register and then to go and vote? Is it difficult? Is it easy? I mean, I is think it, this time what around, are the challenges? this time around, I think there's a special awakening. I don't know why, but uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, people are very excited about um, the elections this year. People, uh, young people especially, are, I hope, have registered in quite, uh, in their numbers mm -hmm. and are ready to, 
to present our voice. I know I am. Yeah. Um, I think it, it wasn't as, as, as hard as we thought it, w it would have been. And we are, I think we'll, we'll have a good number of young people vote this year. So that's quite encouraging, I think. Okay. So the campaign, like, is it, is it still very much like the I Am Positive campaign? Is it digital or? It was digital, yeah. yes. So it was quite similar to what we were doing, with the work that we were doing with I Am Positive. We were just trying to use our networks to reach out to as many young people as we could. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, encouraging them to register. And hopefully we will start again once the, as we draw closer to, you know, election day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so also, I know you, you mentioned that you're a mom. Yes. But you're also a mommy blogger. Right. Yeah. So how is it being a mommy blogger? And how is it, very, how is it different from being, for example, a lifestyle blogger or um, a fashion blogger? I think, I think being a mom blogger is, for me, it's always been very exciting. It's always presented a great opportunity for me to learn a lot of things from other parents to share, to um, advise, to um, get good bargains. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's something that was always fun for me. It was very exciting. It was, uh, I felt that I was going through something with a lot, other peop a lot of other moms out there. And it was, it, it's, it's always been really, really exciting for me. And I yeah. like it. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever um, get, um, you know, negative or maybe did you ever get challenged by the advice that you're giving because you're a young you're a younger well, mother first off i was trying not to give as much <laughs> advice i was trying to take it yeah. uh, to be challenged i have um but i think i responded to it quite well it was i think something around nutrition but again it's all about learning i don't think yeah. anyone is an expert yet i don't think anyone has it down to a t and you know it's it's just I think I always encourage most of my readers to just um, try and learn, try and keep an open mind, try and, you know, n not necessarily what works for you is what works for me. And yeah, mm. I think we move forward quite well. Yeah. So I think I've covered, have you? <laughs> most, most of everything. Yeah. But then um, usually I, I like for the speaker of the night to kind of give advice. So what five things would you tell the entrepreneurs here today um, would you advise them to do as an entrepreneur in Tanzania operating in Tanzania well I think at first is one of the things that always I found to be very helpful is knowing who you are um, I think that kind of base is that base or a strong base of knowing that kind of really helps you your values it grounds you where you're headed what you want for yourself always has has served to help me quite significantly I think doing the right thing also is something that I aspire to I don't always get it right but I try to, to I try to do right by things I try to to do them well um, having a vision and sticking to it having that conviction is something that's really important to it to to me and to when when you apply to to, to entrepreneurship altogether and i think um just being of service so one of the things that has always been very important to me and has helped me throughout my entrepreneurship is that it's not only about me and what it would mean for me it's mm -hmm. about the greater good yeah. it's about it's not only about me it's not only about my employees they have families too they have the community and we try and do things that would mean over and above ourselves yeah. i think those things have always helped, helped you know you. yeah put me in the right path okay uh, maybe one piece of, of advice that you'd give to women entrepreneurs from your experience so first yeah. off um, women entrepreneurship and specifically moms will we can't well we try to do it all but it's very difficult to do everything a hundred percent all the time being a mother being a working mother so to speak is very difficult um, I think I've rest rested in the fact that I can't do everything all the time and I've cut myself a break a lot of times but I do also do things to the best of my ability. I give it my all 100%. I prioritize quite a bit. I think this is important beyond being a working mother. I think prioritizing um, is important. And I think doing things and doing things well to, to 100% of what you can give it and then everything else, you know, I believe works out. Well, yeah? And what's three things that 
three things when you tell entrepreneurs. You like three to things. do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get as much from you as I yeah. possibly can. Not to do, I think um, a mistake that I myself have seen with a lot of entrepreneurs or a lot of individuals or young people in my country is to buying into someone else's vision all the time. You see, I think it's possibly in the way that we've been raised, uh, you get an opinion from mom, you get an opinion from dad, which is a good thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it. Yeah. I think that trusting that little voice is always very important. I think um, holding on to an original idea and what it meant and the reason why you thought of it the way you did is always something important. Encur I encourage to conversate about things and you know, learning about other people's opinion and, and whatnot, but I think also staying true is quite important. So I would encourage people not to buy into, um, you know, buying into, you know, other people's ideas all the time. Um, be wise about money is always a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I know I haven't always. <laughs> but by being wise about money is important. And um, yeah, I think those are the two I have at the moment. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you, Cindy. Um, maybe we'll just go to some Q and A, some questions from the audience. Can we have a microphone, please? Yeah, well, thank you, Cindy, for stealing my question. <laughs> um, more of a comment, okay? One thing that really stuck out to me was the fact that you mentioned it was by chance, or you should say luck, that you managed to get involved into the whole pageant industry. Yeah. Yeah, and I just wanted to sort of hear your thoughts on how much of a factor that luck and chance plays into certain things happening because that's something I think a lot of people don't mention. They always say hard work and this and that and blah, 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 blah. I mean, I, th I don't discredit altogether the role that hard work um, plays or has to play. I think hard work across the board is an important thing. Um, if I, yes, I do feel that it was by chance that I went into Miss Tanzania, but had, had I not possibly worked hard or committed myself 100%, it probably wouldn't have worked out the way it did. I don't discount things happening by chance in my life because I've seen it. I wasn't thinking about it, I wasn't prepared for it in any way, shape, or form. But once it came along, I think I um, worked hard at it, I committed to it, I wanted to do it and do it well, and I did, and I think it worked out for me pretty well as well. So I don't discount um, hard work at all. Yes, so I wanted to ask, how do you go about, um, Mrs. Susan, you're a serial entrepreneur, how do you go about ev evaluating different ideas to become, you know, to turn into a profitable or a, or a venture in full? Um, so for me, I, I um, I've done, I've studied for, I did business administration, so I pretty much plan them out. I prepare really um, intense business plans. Um, but I also, I, I, you know, I look into the numbers, what it poses for me, the, the vi viability in terms of it working out, feasibility as well. So I try and plan it out, I consult as well, I try and look into people who have possibly done it before or have not, I seek advice as well. That's how I, I look into um, possible business ideas and ventures. But I try and involve a lot of the people who I know possibly have done it before. I learn from best practice. I think that's helped me quite significantly in trying to establish something new or <coughs> doing something that I have not done uh, outside of my comfort zone. No, there's somebody here. Uh, I have two questions. Um, you're from fashion industry, and so that's uh, where you come from. But then eventually after you join Bongo 5, Bongo Flavor Music is taking a lot of contact in it. It's a leading. Uh, I'm just wondering, why, why, why is it Bongo Flavor and not, and not fashion, let's say, the one which is taking more, more content is about music and, and so on, and, and, and the other thing, not fashion, and other thing which I think you, you are more of it because you, you are where you're from. Okay. And another thing I'd like to know, you, you say you're, you're, you're a team of 12, eh? and I, I didn't hear you mention marketing people. I, I wonder how, how do you get 
uh, I would do get client, let's say, yeah, just something like that, and, and know what, what you do exactly to, to, to get corporate people into putting their adverts and so, and so on. How does it count? And for, for the benefit of a person here, you know, you have entrepreneurs in here, and perhaps there's one who want to join the, the blogging, uh, websiting industry. What the tip of advice do you, do you have for him or her? Okay. Um, so your first question was that I'm from the fashion, fashion industry and why doesn't the platform give a lot of the fashion content? I think, well, it's not entirely about me. Um, I wish it was. <laughs> but um, we, it's entertainment focused, yes. We do double in different kinds of content as well. We have fashion every now and then. It doesn't necessarily, it's not as popular. Maybe this is why you don't see it a lot. Um, but we double here and there. It's, we run a, a lot of types of content, technology, we do entertainment, we do music and whatnot. And we do fashion as well. Perhaps we'll look into doing a lot more fashion posts. Perhaps we'll get you visiting a lot more. Um, <laughs> and in terms of, you did not hear me say a marketing person because I do it mostly myself. I said me. Uh, perhaps I should have said marketing me. Um, so I do a lot of the marketing for the blog myself. I approach clients a lot of the times. I try and get, get us business. So I mostly handle that. Um, but I think it's possibly time for us to <laughs> hire a marketing person but I've been doing it a lot myself. And um, for the benefit of someone who wants to go into blogging, I would advise, um, so there's been um, growth spurt, so to say, of blogs in Tanzania at the moment, but the key I think would be to just try and come up with something different or content that is different that would still be appealing. I think we have a lot of entertainment platforms at the moment. We have, um, we need some, I think, there's always an opportunity for something different. And I, I, I do feel that um, if one was to be thinking about it, or even if it's blogging about entertainment, but just possibly do it dif some way, somehow differently to set you apart from everything else that is currently in the market. That's what I would advise. There's some ladies over there. My question is about Bongo 5. Yes. And I'm interested in knowing how is it easy or difficult running a family business. Some of us are married, some of us do business <laughs> with our partners, relatives and all that. But it's also interesting to know, how is it like running a family business? Um, so, it's not easy <laughs> at all. Um, a lot of the times, we have the most different of ideas. And to be able to possibly have a work argument and then not have a home argument is something that even I struggle with at the moment. But I think it has a lot to do with, um, I think how to make it work would be to, first of all, be extremely understanding, patient. Um, and now I'm just talking about him, because I'm not patient. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but I also think that to just, a lot of times I try to understand where he would be coming from and why he's saying what he's saying the way he is saying. Um, and I, it takes a lot of patience, it's not easy, and really taking it just one step at a time. Um, yeah, but I think I don't have it nipped to the bud. I would love to learn how other people do it as well, but I am just taking it one day at a time with a lot of patience. Yeah. Just throw, you just threw him under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, sorry, can I advise you take maybe more than one question? So yeah. Sure. Ask yeah. Them. Yeah. So we'll, I'll get three, so one, two, and then three. Yeah. I would like to know one thing. Uh, in your experience, have you ever had a moment where you had to be flexible, maybe to pivot on the idea that you started with, or you had to change your cause and then come back to it later? The thing that really, I really connected to was you said that you really love learning and growing and developing. So my question is, how do you keep that, trying new things, learning, developing yourself, whilst presenting yourself as someone who's seasoned, experienced, and especially if you're going into a new field or a new role that you don't have the experience in, how do you present yourself as credible to someone who's maybe investing or that you need to listen to you as, as your boss or something? 
Um, I have a question. You do? Yes. <laughs> but it's like, it's like two questions, okay. but in one. So I, I, I had to say that first. Where do you picture yourself after 10 to 20 years? Um, meaning that you're doing what you like, right? It's your passion. But as an entrepreneur, you, and you said you're a planner, you plan for things like, so after 20 to 10 years, do you still picture yourself doing your passion? What's the second question? It was... Okay. <laughs> um, the first question was about if I've ever been faced with having to change my vision to accommodate and whatnot. I have. I have been faced with a situation where I have a vision, I'm, uh, all the conviction, all of those nice things that I said. Um, <laughs> and then, yes, I've had to change it to accommodate. It's not... The reason why I said it's important to have a vision and stick to it is because it ended up not working out to what I expected or anticipated. And I kind of have had to learn the hard way um, once or twice in that regard. And that's why I, I always insist or advise to stick to one's vision because um, in the end, that's all you have. That's all you can hold on to. Um, so yes, I have, but it didn't work out very well. The second question was, uh, how do I present myself to be credible? I think that once you have, I carry a lot of experience with me. Sometimes it's not necessarily in the field that I am attempting to go in, but I think um, I can talk a big game. <laughs> and I, um, I do a lot of research. I don't like to do things half heart. I don't like to do things and get to a point where I disappoint myself and disappoint someone who has committed money or um, work or anything that comes with um, an investment or, or having to do with entrepreneurship. So I try very hard. I work very hard um, to make sure that even though I don't know something, I am really, and I also involve people who have the right, who bring the right experience and bring the right resource in something new that I'm trying to, I'm attempting to do. And I think that really helps. So I don't, I don't, pretend to know it all. I try to engage a lot of, a lot of experienced parties if I, if I need to. And I also, um, I do a lot of research. Yeah. So the third question was, so, sorry, what was that question again? Where do you see yourself? Where do I see myself? I see myself running a network. I think um, several television channels, several radio stations, um, owning the online platform as well. Um,